Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to do one of my favorite things. We're going to answer a question. Uh, we had a report sent to us from a paramedic crew. It said that they had taken in a patient with an inferior wall STEMI. Uh, they did all the good stuff, fluid loaded, check V4R, there was no elevation, took the patient to the cath lab, met door to balloon times, patient was reperfused and discharged. They got their report from the interventional cardiology team and rather than hearing that the right coronary artery was occluded, the report said that it was a 99% occlusion of the left circumflex. And they were kind of thrown, thrown for a loop there. They had been uh, taught from the very beginning that the right coronary artery being occluded is what causes an inferior wall MI. So they verified the report to make sure that it was accurate, you know, no patient information mixed up. And of course it was. And then they, they sent the question to us, how is this possible? How does this happen? Is this a unique thing? Well, the answer is no, not really. Any of the three main coronary arteries being occluded can actually cause an inferior wall MI. It can manifest as elevation in two, three, and ABF. The other signs surrounding it are a little bit different, and you can actually tell what artery is occluded based upon the signs in the EKG. Now, I know that's a big claim, so let me jump right into the nuts and bolts of it so I can back it up. So first things, they say uh, inferior wall MI is an occlusion of the RCA. This is taught in uh, tons of paramedic programs, tons of critical care classes, uh, nursing programs, etc. Okay, And around 85% of the time, that's true. So 85 out of 100 patients, when you see an inferior wall MI, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at an occlusion of the right coronary artery. Around 15% of the time, you're not. 15% of the time, it's a left circumflex occlusion, so on the opposite side of the heart. But remember that all three coronary arteries do terminate somewhere in the neighborhood of the inferior wall, except for the, the ones that wrap around, which is uh, often the case in the LAD. Now, it's rare to see a wrap around or what's called a type 3 LAD wrap around uh, occlusion there. It's rare, but it does happen. So we've got EKGs from that as well in this video. So let's talk about it. First things first, when we're looking for an inferior wall MI, we're looking for uh, ST elevation to be present in 2, 3, and AVF with reciprocal depression in 1 and AVL most of the time, right? Most of the time. We're going to explain. So when the right coronary artery is included, all right, when there's an inferior STEMI due to right coronary artery occlusion, a couple of unique things happen. Now, these are the run-of-the-mill things you were probably taught about. So you get reciprocal depression in both lead one and AVL. The ST elevation is often greater in lead three than in lead two. And the ST elevation is also sometimes present in V4R, right? And an infarcted right ventricle as the right coronary artery does perfuse part of the right ventricle. We also see Brady arrhythmias with these, right? Because the right coronary artery perfuses the entirety of the conduction system. So it's very common to see sinus bradycardia or our heart blocks, first, second, type one, second, type two, and third degree, okay? So let's have a look at an EKG. Now let's highlight some things. First of all, reciprocal depression in both one and AVL, right? We have our elevation in uh, lead three is taller than that of lead two. In lead V5, we don't see any elevation whatsoever. Lead V6, same thing. That's going to become important here in just a minute. So what we have here is ST elevation in 2, 3, and AVF with reciprocal depression in 1 and AVL with ST elevation that is higher, a greater amount of millimeters, in lead 3 than lead 2. That is highly indicative of a right coronary artery occlusion, and that is the inferior wall MI you're going to get 85% of the time. So let's move forward. Also, this is a bradycardic rhythm if you didn't notice that. So the, all signs point to yes, that this is a right coronary artery occlusion. Let's talk about when it's not. So when the left circumflex is occluded and, and presenting is an inferior wall MI, that's important. Um, if you have a dominant LCX patient that manifests as an inferior wall MI, reciprocal depression is often absent in lead one. So it's either barely there or, or completely not there at all. Okay, so a normal PQRST, no ST segment depression. Um, often enough, the reciprocal depression that is present Usually not that great, but it is only present in AVL. And then you have signs of lateral involvement as well. And that's a dead ringer, right? Because that is where we expect the left circumflex to be perfusing. So you'll see that elevation in V5 and V6 when you have a left circumflex that is occluded in presenting as an inferior wall MI. Remember that the EKG is a very broad scope. We can find things on it that lead us to believe that a certain artery is occluded. But when we see an inferior wall MI, all we can say for certain with no imaging and no advanced tools, all we can say for certain is the inferior wall is infarcted. All right? These findings are highly indicative one way or the other. 
So taking a look at this EKG, this is a left circumflex occlusion that is manifesting as an inferior wall MI. Take a look at lead one. No ST segment depression, okay? If anything, that's a little bit above baseline. Then we move over to leads V5 and V6 and look at this. We have very nice ST segment elevation here, so there's lateral involvement. And moving forward, you can see you have elevation in 3 and AVF um, and none of those higher in lead 3 than lead 2 type rules we see with the right coronary artery, right? So just to recap, left circumflex occlusion, absent ST segment depression in lead 1, we have lateral involvement in V5 and V6, okay? All right, uh, moving forward, an inferior wall MI that presents as a left anterior descending occlusion, okay, or, or maybe an LAD occlusion that presents as an inferior MI is a better way to say that. Um, it's a little different than most of the things you're going to see. One of the things that should jump out at you very quickly, okay, is that you don't have any real SC segment depression to speak of in lead one, and AVL is not that great either. So it's not huge in AVL. It's not that beautiful reciprocal depression that you're used to seeing, all right? So uh, you do, however, have both inferior and anterior elevation. Now, I know lead two doesn't really meet that criteria, but let's look at lead three and AVF. So three and AVF, there's your two contiguous leads that meet STEMI criteria. You have anterior elevation in V3 and V4, and you have Q waves in the in leads V1, V2, and V3 as well. Now, I don't know the exact mechanism behind why they happen that way, but their presence in the LAD occlusion that manifests as an inferior MI is well documented. Okay, so uh, if there's anything to take away from this or like a quick rule you would remember, it would be to look for both inferior and anterior occlusion and start suspecting LAD when you see that, as well as the almost non-existent reciprocal changes in some patients, right? Not all, but some patients. The, the big one is, is the inferior and anterior, the concomitant presentation of elevation there. All right, so at a glance, when you see an inferior wall MI, you kind of want to figure out what it is. If you're like where we work, okay, it's an hour to a PCI facility on a good day. So a sunny day with no traffic, it takes us an hour to get to a place where an emergency cath can be done. So we do want to know what to expect in that 60 minute interval, okay? So at a glance, when you're looking at this, when you see the inferior wall MI, a couple things to look for first. Look at lead one for the ab absence of reciprocal depression, all right? Look at leads two and three and see if the ST elevation is equal. Look at leads V4 and V5 for ST elevation. And if you have all of those things that is highly suggestive of a left circumflex occlusion, that is the second most common inferior wall MI you're going to see, okay? Um, just to add on to it, it's never wrong to check V4R. As a matter of fact, if I have an inferior wall MI, knowing what I know about this and still highly suspecting there's a left circumflex occlusion, I still check V4R. I do it anyway because it's not wrong to make sure you don't have a preload dependent patient before you give them 400 micrograms of nitro. That is always a good idea. It doesn't take long. So better safe than sorry. Okay. The reason we're looking for the LCX occlusion is because it's much less frequent. If we rule out the findings to the left, we know we have a run of the mill, you quote, inferior MI. Okay. That run of the mill inferior wall MI is not meant to say that it's less deadly or more preferable. It's just to let us know that this is gonna require those traditional treatment methods and those traditional things we anticipate. So we anticipate this patient will become bradycardic. We anticipate this patient is going to be preload dependent because of the infarcted right ventricle. We anticipate those regular things. It's just when we see a left circumflex is infarcted, we need to be thinking more about dysfunction of the left ventricle and the left atrium and how that can be compounded and manifest in blood pressures when you lose your atrial kick because your left atrium is infarcted uh, or maybe infarcted or strained, as well as the left ventricle not able to contract properly. So it, it just kind of boils down the pathophys at that point. So remember, the left circumflex does supply the left ventricle and the left atrium, as well as the papillary muscles in the mitral valve. So you can see mitral valve dysfunction with this, okay? You can see abnormal heart sounds. You can see uh, certain arrhythmias can actually manifest as a result of mitral valve dysfunction, as well as mitral valve regurgitation, right? So when you begin to see regurgitation, if blood's going back where it came from, it's not resulting in the blood pressure that keeps the body alive. This is something you would anticipate with a left circumflex MI. So uh, just to kind of a recap, the improper atrial function will cause poor ventricular filling in a left ventricle that is already infarcted and contracting poorly. So it exponentially makes things bad, 
when it's a very large MI. Okay. Uh, so one other takeaway here is the inferior wall MI um, due to the LCX occlusion will usually manifest in heart failure due to infarction um, if not managed or if you know they wait long enough and that that can be a handful if you've had to manage uh, somebody who's failing despite your best efforts. Quick recap, a summary: uh, knowing <clears throat> if the RCA is occluded uh, informs you of several things, right, including the possible right ventricular involvement. Knowing if the LCX is included offers you knowledge of the possible infarction of the left ventricle. That carries its own problems. And then the LAD occlusion resulting in inferior MI is rare, but it does happen. Okay, so uh, rare, but it does happen. And I don't have a specific subset of symptoms to give you for the inferior wall MI due to the LAD. Though Those presentations uh, of patients are anybody's guess. There's, there's not a list of very specific things I could give you where I could say, you know, 90% of the time it's going to happen this way. N nothing I would feel comfortable putting out there for everyone. Um, with that said, that's about it. That is how and why, or well, that's how any coronary artery can manifest as an inferior wall MI, and these are the reasons why you should know it. Thanks for watching, guys, and if you want to know something else, uh, you can post it in the comments, or you're more than welcome to just email us if you don't want to put yourself out there in front of everybody. And that's at shadetreecardiology at gmail.com. Thanks again, guys.